Chapter 50 Redeeming the Time Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 13 to 15 The strong and repeated stress on holy days and on time generally is common to the whole Bible. Time is clearly of great religious importance. Time and change are inseparable in the human mind. We are sharply aware of the passage of time with the fact of change. We may say, with the fictional Tevye, that I don't remember growing older. But a look in the mirror reminds us of the great changes in us. For pagan thought, time and change or mutability have been the enemy. Added to this has been the belief, as witness Aristotle, in cyclical history, in an eternal recurrence of all things. Men have devised clocks to measure time, but they have been unable to define or understand time because the universal relativism of modern science makes definition difficult or impossible. The word clock comes from the French cloche, meaning a bell. Time in the medieval era was, for the ordinary man, regulated by church bells. However heavy his work, its framework was God's world. Bells reminded man of time's pattern and meaning in relationship to Jesus Christ, the Lord of time and history. Music marked time, and musical notes had and have a time value and the value of time is religious and theological. If God has no meaning, or, at best, minimal meaning for the life of man, then time also loses its meaning. If the ultimate fact of the cosmos is simply nothingness, then time also becomes a futility whose end result is nothingness. However much time is standardised by clocks, Without God, time soon becomes an empty and inexplicable thing. Events are dated and occur within the context of time, and any loss of meaning for time means a loss of meaning for events and persons. But the Bible stresses the theological nature of time. It's an aspect of his creation. Not only the fall, but also redemption, restitution and restoration occur within time. Time is a religious, a theological fact. It takes us from creation to the new creation in all its fullness. It serves God's purpose. This means that, while we live in time, it is not our possession or property. Time is given to us by God as an aspect of his redemptive grace. It either blesses us or aggravates our reprobation. Our text begins with a commandment. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. Verse 13. Our anniversaries, birthdays and other commemorations cannot supplant nor obscure the fact that God commands our time and his law word and purposes must be central to it. The first commandment here is to observe the God-appointed times. Our time must be dominated by obedience to God and his law. We have not created either ourselves nor time, and our will, therefore, must not govern our time nor ourselves. When we are too full of ourselves and our hopes and plans, we have then little place for God's purposes and we pay a price for this. Time stripped of God is a living death. The Feast of Tabernacles comes after the harvest. God's order calls for this. The harvest precedes the feast in God's order when men revolt against God's order they often rebel against the natural order of things. The second commandment is, Thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, verses 14 and 15. Rejoice can perhaps be translated as brighten up, 
This is a law. We are not to view our lives and situations humanistically, but rather theologically. Whatever the problem, national, personal, international, economic or political problem may be, we are to rejoice because God is on the throne and he is the Lord of history. The life of Moses was a grim and difficult one, and this is reflected in Psalm 90. All the same, Moses also says, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Psalm 90, verses 12 to 17. We have no right to time independently of God, nor to plan our days apart from his sovereign purposes. We are not our own, St. Paul tells us, for we have been brought with a price by our Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. If we are not our own, much less is time our own. If God be the Lord, as he declares himself to be, To plan and to number our days apart from his calling is to abandon him and to be abandoned by him. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, Paul also tells us, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. To walk as fools is to walk like the ungodly, like those who say in their heart, There is no God. Psalm 14 verse 1 The reference in the psalm is not to avowed atheists, but to practical atheists, to people who leave God out of their thinking and planning. To redeem the time means to buy it back, to restore it to its place under God instead of under our direction or the devil's. Morally, the times are evil, and if we to all practical intent leave God out of the picture, we are fools. He must have priority in all things, and certainly over us and our time, alike his creation. Then, third, our text commands the inclusion in the feasts of our family, our servants, the widow, the orphan, and the alien. Verse 14. Because time and history are not our possession, nor are we our own, we must serve God's purposes therein. This means charity. Having received from God, we must give to others. This is a command. Biblical charity is not a status matter, but a family concern. If we leave our future to the politicians, we will have only an intensification and expansion of our present evils. Only by assuming our responsibilities under Christ to exercise dominion in every sphere can we have godly order and freedom. A responsibility surrendered is a slavery assumed. For us, the requirement of this central sanctuary has been fulfilled in Christ, our new temple and sanctuary, as well as our high priest. When men crucified him, they destroyed the old sanctuary, which his resurrection re-established in his person. Mark chapter 14, verses 57 and 58. Fourth, our text tells us that faithfulness means that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in every sphere of our lives. Verse 15. To seek or to desire God's blessing without first giving him his due obedience is not only to sin, but to blaspheme. 
an antinomian approach to God is forbidden. As Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Antinomianism shows a consistent contempt for God. It confuses grace with a lawless acceptance, and it cheapens whatever it touches. Godly society has a duty to redeem the time, to buy back and restore time and history to its rightful place under God. If charity is left to the state, the poor will increase and will be evil like those around them, and community and society will be superseded by the state 